Good morning. So nice little crowd. Thanks for being here. Um, I'd like to start this talk with a short story of why I'm here today in front of you of, uh, on a Sunday morning. And this story started a few months ago when I met a customer who wanted to replace their uh, Salesforce system uh, by Odoo. And Odoo, for those who don't know, is a, uh, an open source Python uh, ERP. And the particularity of that project was that um, Oh, sorry. Uh, the particularity of that project is that um, Salesforce at uh, that customer is kind of the middle piece of, of a puzzle and it's surrounded by a variety of in-house built application all querying and updating the, the central system. And since we were replacing the middle piece, we had to provide API to those uh, existing systems. And at that time, we had kind of two possibilities to, to provide those API. The first one would have been to say, okay, just use the, the standard Odoo XML RPC API. And that one is, is useful. It's very powerful because it exposes all the Odoo object model and field. But it's actually too powerful because, um, well, first it's daunting. You need to, to know all the details of Odoo to use it uh, efficiently. And then, um, it really exposes the guts of the system. So anytime you are upgrading Odoo, we are adding classes, removing fields, and so on. So you, you risk breaking your, your client. So that was not a good solution. And the other possibility was to create a custom REST API. Um, that would have been, have been clean and nice. We could document it with Swagger and so on. But still, I had the feeling that it was too difficult to do uh, in the short time frame of, of the project. So I was looking so for something more, more efficient. And at that time, uh, Kenneth Rice, the guy who, who wrote uh, Request, for, was creating a, a small framework he called Responder. And that framework is, a, is just a little thing. It's a mashup of existing Python libraries like Starlet and, and stuff like that. But he was including a, a way to create a GraphQL endpoint in a few lines of codes. And that triggered me to have a second look at, at GraphQL. And I quickly found out it could be a solution for a problem. And so we started. We decided to use it for that project. And it quickly was a success because uh, my colleague who was writing the endpoint was actually quite happy and very productive at it. And uh, our client developer were also very happy. They were all saying, oh, well, that technology is very easy to use. And they were using PHP.NET uh, as client uh, programming languages. And they were all very happy with it. And so, well, since it was such a game changer for us, I wanted to share that story. So here am I. So let's go. Um, I'm Stefan, I'm the CTO of Axon. Um, we are a software engineering company in Belgium focusing on a quality open source project. And I spend quite a lot of free time uh, caring about the Odoo Community Association, which um, is a non-profit uh, trying to uh, foster a vibrant open source community around Odoo. We manage kind of 200 uh, GitHub repos with um, thousands of high quality Odoo add-ons. And I'm doing Python since version 1.4. So today I'd like to, well, it's mostly a tutorial. Um, I'll quickly explain what GraphQL is and go into uh, a demo, first from the client side perspective to explain or to give you a feeling of what GraphQL is from the point of view of the client developer and then uh, give you an example of how you can easily create a GraphQL endpoint in Python, and I use Odoo uh, as an example, uh, backend system. Then I'll discuss a little bit how GraphQL is different uh, from other similar technologies, and give you some attention points maybe you'll, you'll want to keep in mind when, when creating your own uh, endpoints. So what is GraphQL? Well, I like to think of it as yet another remote procedure call mechanism. Uh, in a way, it's just that. It's a way to request a remote computer to do something for you and, and return a response. Um, 
it comes from Facebook and they open sourced it in 2015 and obviously those guys know what a graph is um, but really for most usual use cases uh, you don't need to worry too much about the graph aspect and you'll see why in a moment. So the basic characteristics uh, the requests and the queries, you express them in using the GraphQL query language. It's kind of JSON, but it's not, uh, so it's a specific uh, format. The responses are pure JSON, so that's important for ease of integration, so nothing special there. There is a schema language to, to express, uh, to define the various types and available queries. You don't need to worry too much about the schema language because you usually don't see it because you, you generate it from your programming language. And then the transport is usually HTTPS. You do get and post to, to send and receive the data. And there is a variety of server-side libraries uh, in, in most languages. And on the client side, in my opinion, it's so easy that you, you don't need to bother with any kind of library to, to use it. That, that's an important point. So, for the sake of the demonstration, um, we'll use a simple, a simple schema. We'll expose Odoo partners, uh, which are basically uh, companies and contacts with their name, address, uh, email, phone, a flag saying if it's a company or a simple contact. In the address block, uh, you have a country field with, which point to, to country uh, type, which has a code and name. And then uh, the um, uh, companies have contacts and contacts have a partner company. So it's a simple data model, but, but yeah, an in, interesting one for, for a demo. So the demo, um, for, I start from the client side. And the good thing with GraphQL is that you get for free, as soon as you have a GraphQL endpoint, you get for free uh, a web-based IDE that you can use to, to create your, your requests. So on the, on the left, you have the query editor, and on the right, the result pane. And very important, you have a documentation explorer. So you can interactively explore the, the schema, and that documentation is automatically generated by um, uh, introspecting the, the schema provided by the endpoint. So you see here on the right, you have queries and mutations. Mutations are for anything that has side effects, and queries is just for fetching data. If I click on query, I see the available queries, and I focus on, on just one of them, which is called all partners. You can use it to fetch all partners from the database. If I click on it, I see that all partners has three arguments. The first one is a Boolean, saying I just want companies or all of them, and then limit and offset in my examples are for doing paging at the database query level. And then the return type is a list of partners, and if I click on partners, I get the field we have seen before, so simple list of field in this case. Some have, are mandatory, you see them with the, the exclamation point. Um, and then you have country, which is of type country and contacts which is in itself a list of partners so we have a recursive data structure. Now if I start typing a query on the left uh, you see we have code completion so you type control space you see the available keywords so I can type all partners all partners again I see the list of available field I can select those I want and that's um, yeah, I'll zoom a little bit. So that's uh, a very, very important point above gra about GraphQL is that it's the clients who decide which field they want to receive. Whereas if you, you are doing REST, you, are, uh, you, you cannot decide. It's a server that, that's always giving you the same list of, of data. In this case, I, just, I don't want all the fields. I, I want uh, three of them. And in the result, uh, it's just a JSON list of dictionaries. And you see that, the, it's also the second very important point, you see that the response is mirroring the query. So in the query, I say I want all partners, I get all partners in the response. I want name, I get name. I want email, I get email, and so on. 
So your, your response will always mirror what you put in your, in your query, and, and that's uh, very important. Then I can uh, use arguments in my query. So for instance, here I have all partners, companies, and contact, that I want to say I want only companies. That's the syntax to do that. Uh, companies only is true, I get a limited list. And then, also very important aspect of GraphQL, you can navigate in the data model from your query. So in your query, now I want to get the contacts to, I type contacts, name, phone, and again, you see that the response is mirroring your query. So I added contacts, I get contacts, I edit name, I get name, phone, phone, etc. And so that's the other very, very important aspect of GraphQL, is that the client can navigate into the data model. Whereas with traditional REST or RPC, it's more fixed, so the server might have provided uh, uh, a service that's providing companies and another service to get contacts with, as a, an argument, the company ID, for instance. But then that's more server round trips. Uh, con conversely, the server could have decided to provide just one service, providing companies and contact at the same time, but then uh, all the time you send all the data and maybe your clients don't need it. So that's very important in GraphQL, is that the client has the flexibility to express what data he wants to retrieve uh, from the server. Okay? And the last point I want to illustrate um, is the concept of uh, query variables. Uh, query variables are kind of placeholders you can put in, in your query. They can go anywhere in the query, so you can have a very complex query, but you can put placeholder a bit everywhere. And then it's the client which sends to the server the query plus a simple JSON dictionary with the, the replacement variable. And the replacement is done on the server side, so the, there is no risk of, um, of uh, query injections and, and stuff like that. But it's also very important because in terms of data binding on the client, if you imagine you're writing a web application, you need to bind the, the form fields to, to the, the query field. Uh, using this mechanism, this binding is just populating a JSON dictionary. So for client-side developers, it's also very, very easy because they can write their query in the IDE, copy-paste it in the code in a constant, and then uh, bind their, field their form variables to a simple JSON dictionary and send them both to, to the server. Very easy for, for the, the, the client developers. Okay? And you get com code completion also when, when creating variables. And so here's an example, two simple variables, limit and offset for doing paging inside uh, a, a large uh, result set. Okay, so that's it for the client demo. Now we'll dig a little bit on the server side and i illustrate uh, what it takes to create the endpoint I just used in the client side demo. And the code I'm going to show is really all there is to it. I, I give you the pointer after that, you will see that there is really nothing else that I'm going to show to, to create that endpoint. So the first thing to do is create the types. So I start from the bottom. Um, the country type uh, is an easy one, so you represent graph GraphQL type with Python classes, define a country class, just say it's a graphene uh, object type. By the way, graphene is a very good library, uh, an open source library to, to do GraphQL endpoint in Python. It's very, very efficient, and all this actually is made possible by, by those guys. Um, so country class, to just say it's a graphene object type, and uh, the fields are just class attributes, and again, you give them their, their type, you can say if they are required, you can provide default values, you can provide documentation, very important, with, with comments or uh, help attributes, for instance. Um, and you see there is no code to do the binding to the underlying object. Is that because in this case I will have a Nodu ob object um, which has a different name to also have a code and name field. And in that simple case, the, the binding is automatic because the default resolution mechanism is 
uh, for graphene is to do a get attribute on the underlying object. And so if your underlying object has the same attribute names, the mapping will be automatic. So for the partner object, uh, same principle. I enumerate the fields, give that their type, some are required, some not. Uh, this one is a Boolean, required two. You have access to a variety of scalar fields like ints, floats, dates, and, and so on. Um, here I'm using the Odoo object type, but it's really a very, very small uh, extension of the graphene object type to cope with some Odoo peculiarities. For instance, Odoo is representing strings as uh, null strings with false, and converting false uh, to, to GraphQL does not work. For It's not represented as null, so there is small conversion there. But otherwise, for instance, for this one, it's just a graphene object type, so there is nothing specific to, to Odoo here. And then, next example, um, the country field. The country is of type country, so that's the way you declare it. But in Odoo, there is no country attribute on the partner. In Odoo, it's named country ID. That's a convention. And in this case, what you need to do, you need to provide the mapping yourself. And in GraphQL, the, those mappers are called resolver. And the way to do it is to just create by convention a, a method named resolve underscore the field name, so resolve underscore country. And that method is taking two arguments. The root is the associated underlying object, and info is a way to pass context, like the database connection, the current users, or, or stuff like that. So in this case, I map the GraphQL country field to the Odoo field named country ID. And country ID is not an ID in Odoo, it's actually a country object. And that will be bound to the GraphQL country type. And then GraphQL will resolve the country attribute code and name and, and then continue like that. Same for contacts. Contacts is a list. A list of what? A list of partner. The list is re required. In Odoo, I don't have a contacts field. I have a child IDs field. And in this case, resolve contacts will return, just return root.childIDs, which means I'm returning the contacts. Child IDs is a list of Odoo partner objects that again will be bound to the partner GraphQL type. And again, Graphene will recursively call the resolution mechanism that you start to understand to, to re recursively resolve all, all the fields. And that's all you have to do to, to map those types. And then you have the, the top, top level query. So we come to all partners that we've seen at the beginning. All partners is returning a list of what a list of partners. And then it has three arguments. You see again companies only is a Boolean, limit and offset that we have seen before. And that as is does not exist on the backend system, so I need to write a resolver too. It's always the same, write a resolver. So I write resolve all partner, I get root and info again, and then the arguments, companies only limit offset. And then that's more traditional stuff, I build my query. So that's a little bit of Odoo code. Uh, if the client wants companies only, I build my, my query, is companies true? I do an Odoo search and I pass limit and offset and the Odoo search is going to re return um, a list of partner objects again that will go through the resolver mechanism and so on and so on. And then a few small glue code to create uh, the HTTP route and basically that's it. So that's all you have to do to, to bind um, uh, a GraphQL schema to an existing uh, backend system. So, as you see, there is very little Odoo code, so you can imagine that's going to work with basically anything you have, if you have Django or SQL Alchemy in the backend, or what, whatever you can think of. It will be as easy to, to, to do it. So, very efficient. Okay, so, um, now let's discuss a little bit of, of GraphQL. Let's go a little bit deeper. So, how is GraphQL different? Um, well, I like to compare it to two things. On the one side, traditional RPC technologies, and on, on the other side, SQL. 
Traditional RPC technologies, those are very different, DCOM, CORBA, SOAP, REST, whatever, but in the end they have in common that you have a rigid request response structure. So the, the, the service you provide define exactly what the client when, when can request and what he will receive in response for any service. They all have some sort of, of schema language that, uh, that is machine readable, so you can introspect it, implement validation, and the standard on the wire protocol. And for those, it's the service developer uh, who implements uh, how the server reacts to, to, to a service. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, SQL. And there, uh, of course, you have a database. And then it's the client that has the full freedom to express his query. Uh, he can do whatever you want, provided uh, it, it follows the database schema. So full flexibility for the client, but so to speak, there is no server-side developer. You must have a database, OK? Uh, if you exclude store procedure, which actually fall in the other category, you have no possibility to or, or it's very difficult to access uh, external systems with a SQL database. So GraphQL is a bit in between. So you have full flexibility for the client to express the query, but on the other side, you have a very easy mechanism for the server-side developer to, to, to decide how to respond to any given query. And so you don't even need a database. You can query back-end systems or a variety of uh, whatever you want on, on the back-end. So it's really something in between uh, uh, RPC and, and uh, database query language. So some attention points. Um, well, you sometimes read on the internet that a GraphQL is presented as a better REST. So is it, is it not? I don't know. Uh, it's different, uh, but first of all, the typical um, complaints you see again GraphQL is people say it's not respecting HTTP semantics. Well, that's true, and uh, GraphQL basically uses HTTP as a dumb pipe to, to send the request and get the, the responses. So you don't really benefit from the HTTP infrastructure for caching and, uh, and so on. You benefit from authentication and, and stuff like that, but some HTTP infrastructure is oblivious to, to GraphQL. Well, to me, uh, actually writing a good REST API is incredibly art. Uh, it's really an art that very few master doing a REST API that respects HTTP semantics fully. So yeah, you decide for yourself. Uh, for me, it's a better REST in the sense that it's, you are really more productive when creating services with GraphQL than, than with REST. And that, that's something that I see for, for real and real projects. Another attention point is performance. Uh, you must pay attention to the way you write your, your resolvers. For instance, in the resolve contact one, uh, if I would have written for each one doing a search on parent ID is root ID, that would have worked too, but in the end that would have gener generated one database query for each parent company in the, in the result set. Not very efficient. So the good thing to do is to exploit the power of your, um, of your object relation and mapper. How do does it? SQL Alchemy does it? They have prefetching strategies, uh, and that would end up in this case in two queries: one for the parent, one for the children, and so much more efficient. So you need to pay attention to that. Um, the other aspect is decide what to expose in your GraphQL endpoint. Uh, with some tools, for instance, there are uh, adapters for Django, SQL Alchemy. It can be very easy to expose your whole uh, object model in, in, uh, at once w without doing almost anything. Uh, it can be useful in some cases, but um, I advise to create GraphQL endpoints that are specific to the client use case, because exposing your whole object uh, model uh, will prevent you changing it, because you will never know what parts of it are, are used by, by the client. And since it's so easy to create specific uh, uh, schemas, you really need, 
want to, 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 to use that power to do uh, schemas adapted to the client's use case. Okay, finishing. Access control, pay attention to it. Um, because uh, for REST it's easy to put access control at the entry point. Uh, here you need to put access control at the, the level of the domain, the domain model. So, key takeaways, it's different. Uh, I really encourage you to try it. If you see it as another way to do REST, uh, you will see that it's a very powerful technology. And in my opinion, you get really more productive than by doing REST. You give a lot of flexibility to your client developer and a lot of productivity to your server-side developer. You have the links, the slides are online. And I don't know if you have time for questions. No, no time for questions, so I'll be around. Sorry. <laughs>